I'd like to welcome Edmund Red, our passenger profile for the month of December 2021. Welcome, Edmund. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Michael. I'm excited to have you. Uh, I've seen your name in the chat room many times. As we discussed a couple minutes ago, we met briefly at the 2017 Road Rally. Um, and uh, first of all, thank you for doing this on a weekend on short notice. And second of all, I really have had you in the back of my mind to do it for a while because you do something that's a little bit rare, which is you focus primarily on trailer music. And so we're going to get into that because I think a lot of other taxi members out there want to know more about it and will be curious to learn what your path has been so far. So um, let's start out by um, just talking about specifically what you do, and then we'll go back and get the background stuff. But yeah, tell, tell everybody what it is that you do. Sure. So, um, um, well, I've been a taxi member uh, since 2016, uh, the beginning of 2016. And I, by chance, we'll get to this one, but by, by chance, I got my, uh, my first forward. It was a trailer uh, queue. So uh, I had no idea about trailer music. And I always thought that it was the, the music composer, the, the film music composer that used to do that. Uh, so I always thought it was a score that was put into uh, some sort of trailer uh, music. And then I discovered a whole world of a different business. And actually, trailer wow. houses are like advertising agencies. Uh, so it's a different world. It's a complete... Uh, it's a, it's a marketing tool. Trailers are a marketing tool. So um, there's a format uh, to the picture and then there's a format for the music and it should be in a certain format. Um, and then we we rarely have the occasion to have the picture. So we do score with, with no picture. So it's a total different ball game. I've been doing that for for what, six years now, five years, six years now, and I'm learning the craft every day. So it's it's an ongoing journey. Well, we'll get deep into the weeds on that in a couple of minutes here. But first, I want to get some background on you. Yep. Um, uh, where did you grow up? Uh, let's start with that. Where did you grow up? Okay, so I was born in France, uh, lived there a couple of years, then moved with my family to Lebanon. Um, lived there um, till 26, uh, uh, 2006, and then moved to um, Dubai. Uh, stayed there for 10 years, probably a bit more. And then now I'm based in Montreal, Canada. And were you, did you grow up in a musical household? Were you, how did you get into the whole music thing? Did you ever like, were you in garage bands or did you have a mother that made you take piano lessons? All that kind of background. There is, there is some inclination, inclination in the family towards music. Uh, my grandfather used to play mandolin. My grandmother used to play organ at church uh, by ear. They never did that as professionals. Uh, my dad, used to play a bit of piano my mom a bit of guitar but nothing nothing really it was just like a hobby and they put me for piano lessons by the age of five and this is how it started actually so I started in a conservatory a private conservatory music uh, conservatory and I did that for 12 or 13 years wow yep and then um Around my, my teenage, uh, I used to be in bands and rock bands and heavy metal bands and stuff like that. So, uh, and you were in the Middle East when you were in heavy metal bands? Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, those are two things that normally don't sound like they go together, but I'm probably a little ignorant on the subject. But it, wow. it's, it's a bit, yeah, it's, it's a bit like uh, underground bands and stuff like that. It's not well, uh, well seen there. Yeah, uh, we had the chance with my band. We had the chance to open for acts like Apocalyptica, and uh, so they were they were happening. Yeah, there were a few events happening back then. And then when I left to um, to Dubai, I kind of stopped doing music, and I was trying to. <laughs> 
let's put it this way, be an adult and do things <laughs> that have nothing to do with music. So I, I went and I was working as an art director in an advertising agency for like uh, more than a decade. decade. And then when I moved to Montreal, I was like, okay, enough with the, the corporate work and let me focus on the music for a bit. So uh, that's that. And what made you leave Dubai and move to Montreal? Well, you probably know the situation in the Middle East is so unstable and you can't, you can't focus on anything, actually. And you're always torn between staying or leaving or if you give it a chance or not. And sometimes you, you just can't plan your things. And I needed some stability. I needed some peace of mind. And I wanted just to give music a chance. And uh, why Quebec out of all the cities? Not that it's not a beautiful place and you shouldn't have moved there, but why Quebec? I mean, you had a, a choice of any city anywhere in the world. Um, not really. Um, we, we came, my wife and I, we came as uh, immigrants to, uh, to, uh, Mont- to Canada. Uh, we landed actually in Toronto and we stayed there for a couple of months and it was, it was okay. But then... It was like just a financial decision to move to uh, Montreal because it was cheaper. Rent was cheaper and we were out of work, both of us. So we moved to Montreal and then COVID hit and we're home since then. So I guess it was like, yeah, it was a perfect timing and a a good decision, I, I, I suppose. Well, I've only been there once, but it's a really cool city. I I remember uh, thinking that it was very clean and and kind of pretty from my hotel room window. So good choice on that. Um, Canadians Canadians are the friendliest out of all the countries I've ever visited. Canadians are like the friendliest people ever. They they are. And and plus add to that, that I'm I'm a uh, French educated. So my, 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 my primary language is French. So it's, it was a bit easier for me to just blend. Although the, 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 Quebecer French is a bit different from the French French. Right. But that's a detail. Um, totally off subject, and I'm sorry for doing this in the middle of an interview, but when you lived in France, did you ever hear of an artist named Gilbert Montagné? Yeah, of course. Okay, so I just had dinner with him two weeks ago in Israel. Okay. I, I produced, um, I think, three or four songs for him in like 1978, and we hadn't seen each other in 35 or 40 years, and Gilbert and I and our two wives went out for dinner. Um, he has a place in Tel Aviv and a place in Paris, and he happened to be in Tel Aviv when I was in Israel on some family and business stuff, so we got together for the first time in a long time. It was Great to see him. He's like a, a national awesome. treasure in France. Yeah, he is. He is. And, and still making great music. He, he's yep. now like, you know, the elder statesman of music. <laughs> anyway, I digress. Um, so I think a lot of people watch trailers. They hear trailers. They go, oh, man, I've got some cool samples, uh, you know, and, and I could do that, man. It's so exciting. It's big. It's bombastic. And it makes your heart race. And, I, you know, my friend walked in the room, said, man, you should be doing trailers. And I think that they don't really, you mentioned this already, but they don't understand that first and foremost, it's advertising. And so it's, can you explain the difference in kind of the mindset and the approach between orchestral music made for trailers uh, versus orchestral music that you might do for a background scene or score in a, in a movie or a TV show? Well, it's, I guess that's, that's, that's one of the, the biggest issue is understanding what you, you try to explain every now and then is the, the arc, the structure. So building and uh, having an arc to the music. So even if you're doing orchestral for background music, you should also have an arc. But what's different in trailer is that it's, uh, it's a three act, they call it the three act or the five acts, or sometimes you can have more than this, but usually you have an intro that sets the mood. And this is this goes for picture and goes for music. So uh, whatever, whatever trailer you see, first thing they would establish where the action is happening. So is it which universe, if it's on which, uh, if it's on Earth, planet Earth, or if it's somewhere in a distant galaxy so there's this setting the the picture first 
Uh, and usually what you want to have here musically is something that is subdued, just announcing a theme, uh, just a couple of instruments, no hits, no nothing. So it's it's really just setting the mood of the cue. So if it's happy, which is not the case, you need drama in, in trailer cases. But, but if it's, let's say, magical, you might have a bit of harps, flutes, just hints of that, just to set the mood. And then usually there's a little break. Now we can go into the details, but the first drop is like, we need to stop the music. There's usually something happening on screen and it freezes for a moment. Most of the time it's the eyes. So there's a focus on the eyes of the actor or something because there's something to be said. And this is where you hold the note a bit. You don't resolve to the root note. And then uh, you have the introduction of the main characters. So you see and that's the hero. Is that the second act? That's the or... second act, yeah. Okay. So there's the introduction of the characters. You have the, the main character, maybe uh, the, the anti-hero as well. So you, you start seeing people and there's like a bit of dialogue happening here and there to just give you a sense of the story. This is where music should be building up to the excitement. So there's this buildup happening. So usually in this section, you will have um, like uh, pulse basses or strings that are playing the ostinato. Ostinato is something like uh, a repeated pattern that is coming in, like repeating every now and then. Mm -hmm. So you're building the tension. Usually most of the time you want to hold your chords, stay on the same note just to give that, uh, that part some intensity. And then there is the big drop, which is where everything stops. There's the downer. And I can tell you a small story about the downer. That's a different thing. But there's this um, bass sound, like sweeping bass uh, frequency that is going, say, from 100 to 20 hertz in like a couple of seconds. And usually on screen, it goes black. And there's a reason it goes black because you want maximum contrast. So between black and then an explosion. So that's the maximum contrast. And this is where you have your third act, which we call it climax or reveal or anything. It's like the big, big part of the, the trailer. This is where you put all your instruments, all your drums, all your hits. Everything is like you, you put all, all what you have in that uh, third act. Now, Traditionally, this is where it ends, but now trailer, there's a trend where trailers are getting a bit longer. Yay for us. <laughs> uh, so, so what happens is when this third act happens, there's a little, little pause and then it goes yet bigger. So it's like when you can't tell what's happening on screen anymore, it's like extremely quick cuts uh firearms everywhere bullets flying uh, everything is happening so quick you you can't even breathe and this is where you go for a suspended cord and you you hold it there and then there's again the black screen and you have the coming soon in theater and the date and the studio logo or whatever so this is the final act or the conclusion where you take back whatever has been said in the intro and play it again nicely and finish it there so um, that's in a nutshell the structure, be it visually or musically. So that last act you described, sometimes uh, it's funny. I watch trailers way more intently than the average moviegoer does because I'm fascinated by what the composers are doing. And I, I don't think I've ever noticed the black. But now that you mention it, I go, oh, yeah. Uh, and you also left out the part where Don Fontaine goes, in a world. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, I don't know. But, but funny enough, this... this um, this trend in movie trailers is not is not there anymore. I know. So there's no voice. There are a few voiceover. I'm not saying they're they're not, but but the thing is, Don Lafontaine was like really a voice, and I guess I guess it was one of the things that hit me with trailers. I I used to like those because of Don Lafontaine voices. So yeah, I don't know. I've actually recorded a part of my career. I, I was uh, working at a very high level audio post studio in New York. I've actually recorded Don doing In a World. <laughs> it's a, literally, you, you could put a 57 with like no EQ, no limiter, no nothing, nothing. in front of that guy. It, he just sounded so good in the room yeah. um, and, and always nailed everything in a take or two. Anyway, um, 
So really fascinating. Uh, and you also mentioned the, the, the fourth act, which I is relatively new from what I can ascertain. I mean, relatively in like the last several years versus that fourth act where they go in theaters, July 22nd. Um, that part didn't used to be there. It would just be a graphic maybe, but not music. So it's like there's that big explosive third act and then a, wow, or something, you know, yep. That, yep. that's just like a, like a, a, a trail off just to let you know, there's still more interesting stuff on the screen. We don't want you to miss. And the newest trend, not, not the newest, but I mean, one of the new trends as well is now you have pre trailers. If you watch them on YouTube, you have like a six or seven seconds before the trailer. So it's like a trailer to the trailer. Uh, <laughs> um, I don't know if we're going into a matrix or something, but the thing is there is like inception or something. I don't know, but you need music for that as well. So there's like a pre-trailer and then the trailer for the movie. But yeah, it's wow. uh, it's it's a word on itself. Uh, I, I guess trailer music is is literally a word on itself. It really is. And that was my main motivation for wanting to interview you because you are a taxi member. You're not unlike your fellow members yet. You've chosen this very specific niche that almost, and we'll get into that in a minute, probably precludes you from working on other stuff because it requires so much focus and so much attention. Um, and speaking of focus and attention, so do you have a day job now or do you do this 12 hours a day or what's your um, current status? I, I actually, uh, I'm, I'm teaching at a school. Uh, I'm giving uh, audio um, for video games. So oh, okay. uh, yeah, integration for, for everything that is audio related and um, music with uh, video games. And uh, another course on mixing and production. So that's my part-time day gig for now. Yeah. Uh, I, do, I do projects on the side for uh, studios and production companies for advertising, stuff like that. Usually those are, the turnaround is like 24 hours, 48 hours max. But those are not constant. So I, I find myself doing one or two projects a month. And it's like one or two days, that's it. So, And you, nothing... were you still doing art direction for ad agencies no. when you were in, no, no. in Dubai, though? When you were, were you, What were you doing when you were like in Lebanon and Dubai? No, no, I, I quit that, uh, that thing because it was, uh, it's, it's intense. And um, I don't find myself in advertising. I can do it, but I don't find myself in it anymore. Um, there's a lot of... Uh, pressure and client requests and close deadlines and overnights and stuff like that. And it gets to you after a while. So health wise and mentally it, it gets to you. So I, I couldn't do that for the, the rest of my life. I mean, I, I find it funny that you chose to do trailers, which can also be that way. Um, yeah, but, but it's, <laughs> it's uh, I, I love doing those. Um, funny enough, there was uh, for Wednesday, there was a, um, magic magic family friendly magic trailer due oh, on yeah. wednesday a, a taxi thing right yeah, yeah yeah exactly so on on monday on monday i started the piano sketch and i found myself on tuesday at, actually on wednesday at 2 a.m <laughs> doing my mix and sending it because i had like half an hour before the deadline so but i was happy doing it that's yeah. the difference well Trust me when I tell you that you weren't the only person that had a half an hour. I think uh, we can sit here and watch our, our database, watch the submission numbers go up, you know, in that last couple of hours before the deadline. It's like every, look, we've all done it our whole life. When do you yeah. study for a test? <laughs> Two yeah. hours before you go to class. Yeah. But the difference is that I'm, I'm loving what I'm doing. That's the yeah. difference. Yeah. It really does make, when you love what you do, it's never a job, right? Exactly. Um. So how do you balance your work life uh, and your music life? Well, let, let's take a step back and go, how many hours a day do you spend on music typically? And how do you find the time and how do you balance work and family? It's easy. Um, I do have my, uh, my courses set on a day. So that's, that removes the, the day from the week. So I'm left with four days. Uh, I have one day preparation for the courses because I need to go through the courses. So that, that makes my week uh, three days. 
And then I do work, uh, like I, I do treat music like a day job. So I come into the studio. Uh, it's a home studio. It's not, uh, it's not somewhere else. It's in, in, in the house. So I come to the home studio by nine and I leave it by usually six or seven. Sometimes I, I stay if I have something to do or I go grab dinner with my wife. Uh, we spend the, the night together, uh, the, the evening together. And right. then I go back to the studio and I work till one or two at night. Um, and you mentioned your studio. See, there's my home studio, which is extremely fancy. <laughs> as you can tell, as my hair moves against the green screen. Um, at, for those of you who don't know, that's definitely not my home studio. Um, I don't even have a home studio. But tell us about yours. Um, I think that a lot of people think that before you could even start doing big orchestral stuff or trailers that you need, you know, $10,000 monitors and just, you know, uh, 20, $30,000 worth of gear. Is that the case or is it much simpler? Yes and no, I would say. Uh, but my advice is start with what you have. That's, that's definitely something I, I would highly advise. Uh, start with whatever you have, uh, know what you have, understand what you, you're getting out of what you have, and then you might need to expand, yes, eventually. I mean, I started, when I first started, I was, well, not getting too much into technical details, but I was on an iMac, and it was powerful enough to, to hold up for like 50 tracks, I guess, Beyond wow. that, it was going a bit um, sluggish and I had to freeze some tracks and I had to do a few things in order to have my session running. And then when I decided that I wanted to go uh, do just orchestral and trailer music, I invested in a, in a Mac Tower. So it, it cost a lot of money, but I mean, it's, it's worth the investment. And now I'm still running off this machine. I, and for this uh, listing that I was working on, uh, I was at around, and again, this is not something that you, you should be judging a queue with, but I, just to give you an example, I was at 150 tracks and wow. it was running smoothly. How much RAM do you have in your tower? Uh, 96. That's pretty beefy. Yeah. <laughs> it must have been the, a joyous day at your house uh, when you fired that thing up and got all of your software imported and it worked and you went, wow. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it, just... it was it was it was an epiphany, actually. Yeah, it was because when you want to do such work, you you'll probably need the um, I wouldn't say the fancy computer, but I mean, a powerful machine that would handle this as well. And then. Yeah, you could start with logic. You have uh, orchestral samples in logic. You have the strings, you have the woodwinds, you have the brass, you have everything within the 200 bucks you paid for logic. And you can make them work as well. Now, if you want like quality, not quality, but say if you want to compete with the, the high level players out there, you won't be able to compete with logic uh, instruments, but at least know how to use them. And then when you get your whatever sample library, be it the Vienna or whatever library you have out there, then you could eventually know how to work with them and make them sound good. And you'll get you'll you'll do better choices when you want to buy a sample library because you will need you'll know what you need. Right. That makes perfect sense. Um, are there different tiers? Of, it wasn't that long ago. Um, that maybe eh, it was a while ago, eight or 10 years, I was hanging out with a guy from uh, X-Ray Dog, which is a, a big trailer music company here in L.A. Um, he and I actually lived like a mile apart from each other. And we went out to lunch one day and then every trailer, you know, you, you would build it in the box and then you would go hire, um, a, you know, an orchestra, basically, depending on the size of the trailer that would dictate the size of the orchestra. They were doing a lot of stuff uh, 
Oh gosh, I can't remember uh, with probably the Prague uh, Orchestra or something like that, and doing yep. remote sessions. Yep. And, and basically, he told me at the time he said, "Yeah, you know, you're not going to land a real trailer for like a real movie unless you've got real players." And I keep hearing more and more cases where people I know that have done trailers totally in the box. Frankly, I'm an engineer by trade. Obviously, I haven't uh, you know sat in a control room in a very long time, but I have a really hard time telling the difference between well used sample libraries and the real deal so is it now possible to land uh you know a medium level to maybe even a blockbuster trailer doing it in the box yeah wow yeah that definitely is yes. uh but the thing is um well let's let's put it this way before trailers were mostly focused on orchestral um, nowadays, it's more, not more, but there's a lot of sound design in it and there's a lot of synth in it. So the, the realism factor is not a, a, big, a big factor right now. So you, you're not looking to sound like a symphonic orchestra anymore. You just want it to sound good. So this is why there's, there's a switch, if you want, into um, hybrid style uh, traders rather than orchestral. Uh, and if you're, if you're not recording or if you're not putting any exposed instrument like a solo violin or a solo flute or even a singer, right. uh, you can get away. Uh, but I always, like whenever I have the chance to add um, a real instrument, even if it's one violin or even a singer, if I can collaborate with a singer on that or just something that would sound, let's say organic or recorded live, it will change the whole dynamic of the track. Um, I'm totally drawing a, a blank on his name right now, which I can't believe because I consider him a friend. I can see his face. I can See everything about him, can't think of his name. Anyway, uh, he grew up with a grandfather in Vienna that was a violin teacher. Mar Martin Tichy, is it? Yeah, Martin Tichy. Uh, yeah. He used to live also like two miles from me, and, and he and I and our wives would go out to dinner. Now he's back in, in Austria. But man, if there was ever a guy that you, you know you should reach out to to do a solo violin part on a big bombastic orchestral thing, Martin's your dude. <laughs> he's so talented. <laughs> he is. Uh, do you remember, were you at the road rail? I think it was 2017 or 2018 where I played that track of his in the ballroom. I don't know if you have 2017, but I wasn't there. Uh, I was it, in it was, some of the classes, probably. He did. I, a piece I heard that sounded like Pirates of the Caribbean style yeah. thing. And he and he's like such a sweet man and a good guy with a just warm heart and personality. And he goes, is this any good? <laughs> like, yeah, it's really good. <laughs> I remember I went out of class and then there was another taxi member who reached out and he was like, you should listen to that piece. I was like, what's the guy's name? So I could listen to it. He was like, I don't remember, but it was amazing. I was like, okay, fine. And then you mentioned it again. And I guess I, I found a way to, to listen to the piece and I, it was really impressive. Yeah. Yep. Very exciting and all done in the box, except for the lead violin. And yep. that made a world of difference. Uh, I mean, even the stuff they did in the box sounded immaculate, but adding that live solo violin, just like you would never think for a minute that that wasn't a real orchestra. Um, so what about somebody who is not very strong on music theory and orchestration? Can they do trailer stuff? Do you need that kind of background um, or, or do you need to be formally trained? I mean, you went to a conservatory for 12 or 13 years, so you clearly have the background. Yeah, but, but again, uh, think of trailers as marketing tools. So yeah. it should be straightforward and with, with no complication whatsoever, straight to the point. Yeah, I mean, uh, mu musically, it's like you're not trying to win composer of the year. You're exactly, trying to create exactly. impact. There are few, few trailers that are on D all the time. Yeah. So uh, it's just understanding. Okay. Um, th there's one thing uh, that I've learned recently because I'm not into the cues, but I've recently discovered that tension cues or what we call tension cues, there's like tons of tension, different tension cues. So you have for games, for elimination, for you talk about them all the time. Yeah. And well, with trailer, it's the same thing. There's not 
one single style of trailer. So you could have a, an action packed trailer. You can have something called a slow burn trailer. You could have fantasy trailers. You can have adventure trailers. So it's all different. Now, if you're doing action pack, definitely don't go into the complex thing. Go probably with a hard hitting um, rhythmic part, but don't overcomplicate it with chords. So keep it simple on the chords. Now, if you're going into fantasy, uh, a bit of John Powell or John Williams style or Pirate of the Caribbeans, yeah, you might need a bit of like, okay, knowing if you go on, on the ninth or on the seventh, or if you use that mode or that other mode to create that kind of magic feeling, magical feeling. Uh, yeah, you might need it, but that then again, it's it's nothing nothing fancy, something that you can't learn in a, in a, on a YouTube video or something. Thank goodness for YouTube, huh? <laughs> uh, when, let's when talk I, about, oh, go ahead. To, I'm talking about YouTube. When I first started, that's the story. That's my story with Taxi. So when I started, I was, I was submitting piano pieces. Thank and you. I had, it's so, it's so funny because it's almost similar to any member I know, Taxi member I know. So I had an album of piano solo pieces. I, I had done that, went to Amsterdam, recorded that on a, on a 1927 Bechstein uh, upright piano. And I wanted to have that album out. And, and I got this taxi listing asking for a, um, not emotional, melancholic piano, solo piano piece. And I was like, okay, I have an album full of that. <laughs> <laughs> and I submit well I didn't submit one of the pieces from the album I wrote another one and I submitted it and I got a uh, return and I was furious I was angry and I was like that's a scam you know and I went online and I read all the the, the yeah you don't have to sign up with taxi it's a pay for thing you don't have to do that and I was like how on earth I didn't do my research before submitting to taxi and I wanted to reach out and saying because because the reason why it was returned that it was there was like what the screener had said that there was percussion in my piano piece and there was no percussion it was just the pedal sound ah. so i wanted to reach out and say okay wait i can give you that and i can remove the pedal sound just take it and just because this is my music and everyone should listen to my music and love my music from the first time so i started trying to, I, I was trying to find out a way to reach out and then i stumbled on the forums and then i was like oh oh wait a second well that's good that's good that has a structure that has something and i was like okay maybe I oh, you learn. mean listening to other people's stuff on the forum? Yeah. Yeah. Made you aware of that? I got gotcha. you. Okay. Yeah. And uh, then the next, the next thing, the next uh, listing that came up was trailer music. I was like, heck yes, I can do it. So I wrote the piece and I sent it. And funny enough, it got forwarded. And funny enough, it, I got a deal. Wow. So it, it was my first forward, first deal. Pretty like, amazing because okay. that, that is one of the hardest things to get a forward and a deal on would be a trailer composition. It's exactly a very, very high bar. Exactly. So I ha uh, there was there was someone on the the, the taxi forums, a taxi. Um, I don't know if he's still a taxi member, but he has a, a library of music. So he reached out and he was like, "Listen, what I hear here is something that is not what your uh, regular." Uh, submission is happening. So uh, I really like what you're doing, uh, but I can give you a couple of advice. I was wow. like, yeah, sure, please. And he was like, go and check YouTube, check, um, what was his name? Uh, Nick, probably. Nick. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So check his video out and understand the structure and try to, to understand how trailer music works. And this is what I did. So I started following this guy and learning on off YouTube. And this is how it, it, it got me there. Wow. So, um, yeah. It's amazing. A lot of people see trailers. It's very exciting. They know that the pay scale can be 
incredibly lucrative compared to getting attention cue in a reality show might make you, you know, $87 and 15 cents landing a queue in a trailer could make you five grand, 20 grand, 50 grand, even maybe a hundred thousand dollars. And people hear those numbers and they go, I'm going to do trailer music, but they don't do the research that you did. And I'm really glad that you did because it is a, a style unto itself. And as you mentioned, within within the category of trailer orchestrals, there are all these different styles. I mean, and you primarily do um, orchestral or orchestral hybrids, but there are trailers that might have uh, an ethereal female vocalist singing over nothing more than a haunting piano with lots yeah. of, you know, pre-fader reverb or an acoustic guitar piece that's very like Joni Mitchell-esque or something like that. So there, there are the whole world of trailer music, but you're okay. within a range of primarily um, orchestral and orchestral hybrid. I'd say adventure uh, and yeah, adventure mostly and adventure action. So think so, of um, Lara Croft, uh, Jurassic Park, those kind of traders. Uh, rather, than, rather than, I don't know, uh, any horror movie it or something. or So it's more of like adventure action. And I'm trying myself now with the, the magical because I like that. It yeah. requires a lot of orchestral instruments. So I like that as well. So I'm giving that a chance. So I'm submitting and seeing, waiting for the results for that one and see. Well, I hope you get it. Um, let's talk a bit about the difference between straight orchestral and orchestral hybrid. Define what hybrid is for people who are completely new and might not know. And then let's talk about how you would produce, uh, compose and produce one versus the other. Great. So um, orchestral, uh, orchestral is basically using the orchestral instruments. Um, in trailer music, you rarely find the woodwind section. So you have the strings, uh, so you have violin one, two, violas, uh, celli, and basses. Um, rarely have the woodwinds, but you can include the flute if you want. You can have the clarinet, the oboe. Uh, so that's the second section. Um, there's the bassoon, contrabassoon. But I mean, you don't have to go into the, this kind of details. And then you have the, the brass. Uh, the brass, you'd have the trumpets, you'd have the horns, you'd have the chimbasso. Chimbasso are the, the low end, big, uh, big brassy sounds. Uh, you could have, yeah, we said the trumpets. So that's the, the woodwind section. And then you have your percussion section. Now, when we're talking about percussion in trailers, usually it's not timpanis and big drums. Usually it's more... Uh, taikos, uh, big hits, uh, processed hits. So usually, even if you're doing orchestral, purely orchestral traders, you might want to use uh, what we call hybrid hits because okay. that's the sound we, we look for. Uh, when we're talking hybrid is when you start adding instruments that are not necessarily into the, the, the orchestra. So Piano could be considered as one of the orchestral instruments, so don't put that in. But you could have electric guitars, you can have electric basses, you could have any sort of synth pads, uh, pulse basses, pulse synth. Uh, you could have sound design, reversed sounds, uh, swoosh, swishes, down. So I'm, I'm guessing you know taxi member Randon Purcell. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and buy all his stuff, which is great. I mean, I love what they put together. Uh, yeah. What's the name of his company? I'm drawing a blank. Fallout, Fallout Music. Fallout Music Group. Yeah, check yeah. out their stuff. Anybody watching this, if you're looking for extremely well put together, tastefully produced elemental stuff that you can include in trailers, they've they use it, they created it, and they made it really, really good. So I want to give him a plug. So... Yeah. Um, Earlier, you mentioned Tycho's and all these things that would go into a hybrid, but yet the trailer editors and producers will add stuff from sound effects libraries after you've done it. So do you have to think in terms of I've got too much or I should leave a hole here because they may add stuff later? Or do you throw everything at it that you feel compositionally is necessary? And will they ask for stems, take stuff out and maybe replace it with their own 
uh, I mean, they treat it more like sound effects, but you would treat it as an element in your composition. They treat it as let's fly in a big bram or let's fly in a big explosion or a big taiko drum or whatever. Um, so do you compose with that stuff in mind or not? Definitely, definitely. When I, at least from my end, when I'm, whenever I'm writing uh, trailer music, I usually try to give the editor the flexibility. So what I tend to do, for example, is uh, for my breaks. So between parts, mm -hmm. I don't do breaks, equal breaks. So I can give them sometimes a bar, sometimes two bars, sometimes a bar and a half, so they can pick and choose which drop they want to use. Uh, so instead of making making my life easy and just doing, okay, just that's one bar of pose. No, I would think, okay, this might be interesting if I can give them that sound effect within, so they can cut and, and paste it whatever they want. So I would think in terms of how can I make their job easier? Now, when it comes to composition, I composition should be at least for me, when you listen to the piece, it should be perfect. So I don't compromise on that. Now, if you don't like my triplets, my Taiko triplets, and it doesn't work with your picture, well, okay, I'll give you the stem, you just remove them. But I usually make it compositionally okay and good so it can work on its own. Now, there's another point that I didn't mention before that some most of the times, unless it's a, it's a, um, a custom trailer that is made two pictures, but most of the time they would take an intro from one queue uh, and uh, a build up from another queue and then put it together. Right. So that's, that's where the importance of metadata when you say, okay, that's my tempo and that's my key. So if they have two tracks in the same key, they can use it together. Uh, also there's libraries, uh, libraries as in publishers that only do sound effects. So you have to think of the trailer as um, the trailer, the whole product, the final product as uh, um, an amount of layers and right. music is the last layer. So it's at the bottom of the whole list. So first you have the picture, of course, then you have the dialogue because if the dialogue is not clear, you wouldn't understand the trailer. And then you have the sound effects and then you have the music. So once you understand that and you, 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 you accept the fact that music is not the star of the trailer, you'll mm -hmm. be fine with that. It's a big emotional leap for a lot of musicians. And I certainly understand that because this is what you spend your whole life working to become a great composer. And then you realize, oh, I'm the bastard stepchild of this seven layer cake. <laughs> I'm the stuff that sticks to the bottom of the pan. But if you were to watch the trailer with only dialogue, the video edited in the sound effects, it would suck. You put the music yeah. in, it's beautiful. So I think music should be the cherry on top, not the stuff that sticks to the pan. True. <laughs> True. 